feel free to stick around. We'll take uh, at least the next 10 minutes to answer questions for anybody who wants to stay around. Okay. Most of these questions are, will the speaker be back? I can't hear you. <laughs> right, so let's get through that. Okay, and... Can I speak to the performance, i.e. startup time, of each DI style? One thing in particular I'm interested in is what are the performance implications of class path scanning? Sure, so, so a quick answer to this. Actually, a, a very blanket answer to this is that for most cases, forgive me for a moment, it actually doesn't matter what the performance of startup time is for most situations in most you know, typical enterprise applications. Why am I saying such a, such a blanket thing? Well, the reason is, is because all that wiring, all that component scanning or what have you, is all happening when? At the very, very bootstrapping moment of that application before any user is logged into it or making use of it. So just to be clear, if XML were very, very fast and component scanning were comparatively slow, like let's say it took one full second to do component scanning, which it probably doesn't in any basic application, that one second matters to no one other than the operator starting the application or to the developer who's waiting for it. Now, not a very satisfying answer, right? A better answer is it's really, really fast, right? How do we do that component scanning? We do it with ASM, right? It's extremely fast. I haven't seen, I, I don't think I've ever seen a bug in the Spring Issue Tracker that talks about that being too slow. When it could be slow is if you're scanning the entirety of your class path. You'll notice that when you turn on component scanning, um, you can't scan the, the, the default package because that would assume you're scanning everything in the JDK and everything on your class path, and that would be ridiculous. So you have to at least say com or org or something to narrow it down. And typically, people by the time people say com.mycompany.application, you're dealing with a number of classes in the hundreds or maybe thousands, and that is uh, imperceptibly fast. Um, to do component scanning against. And if it does get too slow, then you can narrow it down further through inclusion and exclusion filters and a number of other ways to be fine-grained about component scanning. Um, otherwise, there are some issues. There's an issue in the issue tracker right now about auto-wiring not being as efficient as it could be with at auto-wired and, comp and component and so on. Um, but, uh, but these are a bit of you know shaving hairs off of time. There's nothing that is considerably slower about one style versus another for most applications. Hope that answers that satisfactorily. Uh, let's see. Um, I can't access the URL for SDS. Can you give me the correct URL? I just happen to have it here. Um, so springsource.com slash developer slash SDS. What is the JDK version requirement for Spring 3? Java 5, right? So JDK 1.5 is what you need. Of course, 1.6 works fine and so on, but 1.5 is what you can do for Spring 3. Before Spring 3, it's still back to Java or uh, JDK 1.4. When will Spring consider outjections like the bijection scheme and JBoss scheme? Technically speaking, you can do this right now. Um, not, just, uh, not just configuration classes, um, but actually any class can have at bean on it. And um, we, we don't call that objection, but it is uh, at least very similar to, to what theme does. And I don't know all the semantics in and outs of, of bijection and so on in theme, but at a fundamental level, um, any Spring component can have an at bean method on it, which means that one bean can create another bean. Uh, so you can check that out. And that might be an under-documented or even undocumented feature. If it is, feel free to put something in Jira. And we'll um, prior to the introduction of that value annotation in Spring 3, is there an easy way to inject simple string values from properties files into annotated bean classes, e.g. at controller? Really, no. I mean, this is basically a hole in, in Spring 2, in Spring 2.5 um, annotation driven injection. Um, people worked around it by doing things like injecting a properties object or injecting a map and querying that, but um, there's just no no clear, straightforward way to, in an annotation way, inject at value, right? Of course you could, you can actually mix and match. You can component scan the class and auto-wire its constructor and setters. 
You can also define that class in XML and inject the properties that you want. That's a feature that, that, that very, very few people know about. And again, I don't know if it's one that was documented, but you can do it. It's, it's not like um, fully overriding the beam, but it's like overlaying the beam. And um, I think that one probably ends up confusing for folks, so I don't necessarily recommend it. But, um, but you can do that, mix and match XML and annotation. Um, have there been similar improvements for JUnit uh, support for dependency injection, i.e. context configuration? If you take a look at the issue tracker, that's another feature that's slated for 3.1. This is, it's actually the third most voted for issue um, in our issue tracker right now. So, the, so you can use con configuration classes in, uh, in your JUnit system tests right now, but you have to roll your own in terms of uh, creating the application context, which is not very nice, right? We have the test context framework for a reason. We have context configuration for a reason. So what we'll be able to do in Spring 3.1 is you'll be able to say at context configuration and instead of passing in a string or string array of XML files, you'll be able to pass in a class literal or array of class literals where those class literals are configuration classes. And that way it'll all remain type safe and you won't have to drop down to a stringified version of the, of the class or what have you. Um, yeah, we had some initial support for that in Java config decided not to port it over immediately so we could really get it right for Spring 3.1. So definitely watch out for that and uh, go vote for the issue because it's already quite popular. Okay, okay, okay. So let's see. How easy is it to migrate from Spring 2.5, which uses Hibernate, JMS, et cetera, to Spring 3.0 annotated configurations? Well, in that regard, there's not going to be a whole lot that changes, right? For example, if you're using Hibernate, if you're configuring Spring and Hibernate together, you're probably using something like local session factory beam or annotation session factory beam to, to get hold of your session factory, right? So that's a great example of a third-party component that you can't annotate, right? So that chunk of XML is going to stick around. Or if you choose, you can port that chunk of, L, chunk of XML over to a configuration class, but that's, again, this kind of one-to-one mapping from XML over to Java. Um, basically, that externalized chunk of configuration for, the, for configuring the session factor and so on isn't going to go away. Um, with regard to JMS, maybe you're using the JMS namespace, creating uh, you know, listener containers and so on. Again, that XML probably sticks around because that JMS namespace is such a nice DSL for configuring JMS resources and infrastructure. That's one of the ones that's an open question for how far do we go with the code-based configuration? Do we, do we really try to map every single namespace one way or another into APIs, configuration APIs, you know, in code? That one's not slated for 3.1 right now. The JMS and namespace itself isn't um, because it's not such a simple kind of switch to flip on like, like annotation config or um, TX annotation driven. So basic answer to that question is that those chunks probably remain the same. It's more about migrating your component classes to using annotations like add eject or migrating your XML over to uh, configuration classes. Uh, da, da, da. Let's see what else we have. I've read guidance that one should favor XML over annotations in very large projects because of the somewhat unpredictable nature of the DI for annotation-driven injection. What are your thoughts on this? So let me just take that apart for a moment. Because of the somewhat unpredictable nature of DI for annotation-driven injection. So if you're listening closely to the, to the, to the talk, you probably mentioned the terms explicit and implicit DI. Right? And when you're using annotations across the whole code base, you're doing literally auto-wiring together the application. So it is predictable. It is deterministic. It is quite clear. There's no, there's no magic or indeterminism in the framework. It is predictable. But it may not be obvious to the end user. Why? Because you may have a situation where the application begins simply. You have transfer service and simple account repository, right? An implementation of account repository, simple account repository. 
And in that way, auto wiring is obvious. There's only one implementation of the account repository, and it automatically wires up the transfer service. But if you have a second implementation of account repository come along, say JDBC account repository or hibernate account repository, and it also becomes a spring managed beam, then you have an ambiguity, right? You have a choice that the container can't make for you. So that is what people are talking about when they say unpredictable. It's more like surprising, right? Like something comes up and you say, oh, wh what's this ambiguity that the container's complaining about? So this is one of the decision points to, to make the decision on. Should we go with all XML or maybe all configuration classes because it's so explicit, it's so clear, and we have a very, very large code base? That, that's a good line of reasoning. It doesn't mean you can make a blanket statement that those are better than annotations, but maybe for your very large application it is. Maybe if you have a very large application where those kinds of ambiguities come up all the time and you can predict that, you're saving yourself some heartache, right? For many applications, even for very large ones, those ambiguity situations may be very rare. I mean, how often really do you have two account repositories in the container at the same time? Only you can answer, but I think the general answer is not that often.